Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this week's uh, Egg Market Situation Outlook. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an extension economist with uh, NDSU Extension. I'm uh, going to have the, the same program we've had the last few weeks as we go forward. Uh, and then afterwards, after the, the webinar is over, uh, we ask that you, if you can, please uh, give us some feedback, uh, including things that you might want us to cover in future weeks. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Brian Parman, uh, who's going to talk about the macro economy. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So today's talk, I'm going to talk some more about unemployment because it's been in the news and it's ever changing. It's And one of the biggest reasons that I spend so much time talking about unemployment is simply because of all the macroeconomic data that unemployment essentially contains in it. For instance, uh, wages are typically higher when there's lower unemployment, people have more disposable income, consumption is higher. And then we all see these statistics, so low unemployment, higher consumer sentiment, and vice versa, even for people who don't lose their jobs, they see that everyone else is losing their jobs or jobs are being lost. And so uh, it gives us uh, an, a pretty good barometer of how things are, are transpiring in the economy. And so that's, that's why this metric is all over the news. That's why we spend a lot of time talking about it. So my next slide, uh, uh, what I want to show is again that table that defines basically the three or the six different metrics of unemployment. And it's important when you hear those numbers to realize which one's being discussed. The one that's touted the most, the one that you see the most frequently is the U3, total unemployed as a percentage of the civilian labor force. Uh, that's the official, the official unemployment rate, but that does not count people who are stopped looking for work, or that doesn't count people who are underemployed. In other words, they took a, a job they had to take in order to make ends meet best they can, but they're, they're not employed in the, the, based on the skill set they have. For instance, a, an electrician who's taking a job doing something else that pays a lot lower, but they did it to, to make ends meet. Okay, so that U3 is the one that's cited the most. The U6 is total unemployed, okay? That's the one there at the bottom. That's people who've gotten frustrated and just given up looking for a job because to be in the U3, you have to be actually actively looking for work but can't find it. In the U6, you've said, perhaps, maybe forget it. I'm just going to give up. There's no jobs out there for me, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it counts the underemployed. So the number that came out um, in my next slide shows that from the BLS data, and that was this morning that this number came out, and this was for April. Uh, Non-farm payrolls lost 20.5 million jobs in April. 20.5 million jobs lost in April alone. This is the largest one month drop in history, period. Uh, more so, they don't have the, the data like they do for the depression, like they do now, but I can almost assuredly say that even during the depression, 20.5 million jobs were never lost in a month. Um, Again, that's a big difference. That's the difference. One of the biggest differences between the current situation and everything else in history, again, is the rate at which it occurred. Typically, there's a run up to these large unemployment numbers and then a slow trickle back down as, in, as we get uh, employment numbers improve. This time, all the jobs were lost in a relative, l relatively short time. And then, of course, the question is how fast will they recover? So that's the U3. Uh, unemployment number and again this is that official one that's often quoted hit so far at about at the end of April about 14.7 percent almost 15 percent before the crisis it was three and a half and at the height of the financial crisis it was almost 11 so we've blown by that by a wide margin and then the U6 what people some people call the real unemployment rate up from about 8.7 percent before COVID-19 crisis to almost 23 percent. So that is a big change and a big reason why there's some sour sentiment about the economy. So my next slide shows the weekly jobless claims that basically led to this and you can see this one uh, the the last one that 3.169 million new claims that was for the week ending last Saturday. That report came out yesterday we can see that it's trending down in terms of number of new filings. It's, it's trending in the right direction, but these are still huge numbers. 3.169 million, again, before COVID would have been a, a huge record, many fold over uh, it had, had it happened before. But since we're coming, looking at where we were, uh, we've added a lot of newly unemployed people in the last six, seven weeks. 
So my next slide shows the that number and this this chart I took from CNBC rather than make my own, but it shows how many jobs were lost in April. So this is monthly job losses going back to uh, 1939. And we can see where April's minus 20.5 million ranks on a historical timeline. And the Great Recession, which is just a little upside down triangle just left of that big line going down, that's the single biggest monthly. So just to put into perspective how big this is uh, on, a, on a historical scale. So my next slide, I just want to talk about the labor force a little bit more, just real quick. And the question is, what jobs will come back and how fast? We lost them extremely fast. There's some comments that have been made out there that a lot of these jobs will come back almost as fast or, or uh, somewhat quickly. Opinions vary on that. And then, and then here's the thing, um, how many of those businesses will still be around for those jobs to return? And if new businesses come in and replace them, how, how fast will that happen? And then the other thing is when you have this level of unemployment, how is that going to impact hourly earnings? Because typically high, uh, high periods of high unemployment, periods of um, recession or depression, those typically drive down hourly earnings, which again leads into consumption and consumer sentiment. If you're making less money, you're obviously your consumer sentiment is reduced and and if we have prolonged unemployment, that keeps consumer sentiment down as well. So that's the things to look for, on the, uh, especially in, when, as it pertains to ag, on the demand side. Is it going to be there and is it going to be as strong looking at the quarters ahead? So my next slide, I, I just want to hit on forbearance requests again and mortgages. Uh, this is what forbearance requests have done since middle of March through the close to the end of April. And you can see that Jeannie Mae, Freddie and uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, this is uh, weekly forbearance request rates uh, as a percentage of service volume. These forbearance requests have declined, kind of like the, the unemployment filings. So they're headed in the right direction. But so far, um, that's, this is still an extremely high uh, amount of forbearance requests. And if you look all the way to the left of the chart, you can see just how high they were before COVID-19 hit. I mean, they spiked and they've continued to be relatively high the last month or so. So my next slide, I just wanna show uh, forbearance plans and what, the, what they kind of have looked like. And there's really two plans, two main plans that have uh, kind of been given to be granted to folks who, who've requested forbearance. Some, some plans add the payments on to the end of the month, okay? So it's as if you, you don't make payments for six months, let's say, hypothetically, and so what they do is they add, in, they add interest to it and then roll it on to the end of the month. So if you had 270 months left on your 30-year on your mortgage or something, you go into forbearance, you'll still have 270 months of payments remaining. They're just going to roll uh, to the tail end of the, of, the, um, of the loan. And so in total, we had 3.5 million borrowers uh, have requested forbearance, and that's approximately 7% of total mortgages. Okay, so my, just uh, shifting here, shift gears real quick, and the uh, Purdue University's Ag Barometer came out uh, recently, and this is for the survey period in April, so this report just came out this week, and this is the lowest reading of the, uh, it's, the it's basically what this chart says is it, it, it encompasses a lot of different things, um, sentiment among farmers, among a, a whole wide range of ag businesses and farmers and what they're trying to gauge is it's kind of like consumer sentiment but it but it's a, a farm and in, in a, a ranch a cent, rancher sentiment and what we see is how much it has declined in the last week I mean it, it has went down uh, or uh, the last month went down rather dramatically from a sentiment of 168 which a lot of that being reflected in optimism about trade and and other things all the way down to 121 at the end of last month, and then down to 96. So it is precipitously dropped. Now my next slide shows the uh, uh, index of future expectations and current expectations. And future expectations are still quite a bit more optimistic than current conditions, the index of current conditions, which is to be expected because right now it's, it's not real promising uh, in ag, but we can see that the, the expectations for the future are 
are pretty well muted as well. You look at where we were just a, just a couple of months ago, the ex, ex, index for future expectations was 175. It's dropped almost, you know, uh, a third, little over a third, and then current has gone, you know, less than half since it was a couple of months ago. So in other words, sentiment among farmers, ranchers, producers is weak right now. Uh, folks are not overly optimistic. They're, the current situation is tough and the expectations down the road, at least in the short run, are not real promising among, among our producers across the country. So my last slide, uh, and I'm gonna shift, totally shift gears here, is regarding uh, hemp policy. We had a hemp meeting yesterday on hemp production hosted by uh, Dave Ripplinger and a slew of other sponsors. And uh, I had the opportunity to moderate two different chat rooms or discussion rooms and the rooms that I was in were on policy. And so I just wanted to hit four highlights from the policy discussion. And the first concern among uh, potential producers, producers and uh, policymakers in Minnesota and North Dakota is crop insurance for hemp over the 3%, 0.3% total TH3 threshold. Um, if that happens, if you get over that 0.3%, the crop has to be destroyed and there really isn't a, and to my understanding, there isn't an insurance mechanism to recoup that, the loss if that art was to happen. That is especially affects uh, CBD producers. So if that happens, the, the crop tests hot, as they say. Uh, yes, if you get a crop failure from drought or these other things, there's crop insurance mechanisms for that, but there doesn't tend to be one for a crop that tests hot. The other discussion was, is there anything that can be done with these crops that test hot, for instance, uh, turning them into fiber, uh, using them as fiber rather than, than CBD or whatever oil that they were gonna be used for in the first place. Give some sort of, some sort of recouping the cost through another use that, that doesn't include uh, CBD oil or whatever else. Then another concern is consistency, consistency among testing facilities and equipment. The thresholds may not be changing, but there is some concern that one facility might have one testing set of test equipment, another facility has another, and the error margins and whatnot on these test equipment can be different, or they can test slightly differently. And they want, there needs to be, according to these folks, some research done to see what the consistency is among test equipment or set guidelines such that every, all testing procedures be exactly the same, including the equipment. And then finally, the, and, and this, one, this idea was kicked around a lot, is the possibilities for use of hemp as animal feed, the, either the grains or the fibers. The fibers don't really make the best animal feed from what I understand because it's just too fibrous. But the, the, the oil seeds that are produced, the grains, can that be used as animal feed or parts of the plant that are not used for anything else? Right now, as far as I know, it is, it is not legal to do that. But that's some of the legislation that they are, they are talking about and discussing with their lobbyists and, and folks in the Department of Ag. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Frayn Olson, who I believe is up next. Thank you. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, so I'm Frayn Olson. I'm the Crop Economist and Marketing Specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, I just thought today I would provide a little bit of a preview for the May USDA WASB report, uh, which will be coming out early next week. So my first slide is just provide an overview of, of kind of the background of this. Uh, the May WASD report, or again, WASD stands for the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates, is that's the first month that USDA and the World Board the, that oversees the, the publication of this provides their forecast for the new marketing year or the new, new crop marketing year. And in, the, in this case, it'll be 2021. Um, and so this will be our first look into what is USDA looking at or, or forecasting for new crop supply and demand conditions. We've been so far to this point, we've been looking at old crop, the 2019-20 crop. Um, we're now moving into the new marketing year. And again, just as a reminder for everybody, for corn and soybeans, the marketing year begins on September 1 and runs through August 1. So that's the 12 month time period that these forecasts are for. And uh, for wheat, uh, the marketing year is from June 1 to May 31. Again, the time is a little bit different, but, but the, the information is basically the same. They're trying to track not only the production, the total inflow of grain, but also then the total outflow. Um, USDA will also update, at least for, uh, for the old crop portion, the demand side or the usage numbers. 
Um, there might be some slight adjustments on the production side. Um, USDA was going to resurvey uh, corn and soybean farmers in uh, several states with the exception of North Dakota to find out what their actual harvested acreage was, was and to confirm their, their average yields. But again, I don't expect those numbers to really be changed at all. This is really be an update on the forecast for the usage numbers. As a reminder to everybody, the reports always come out. They're predetermined. The time is going to be 11 o'clock central time on Tuesday, May 12th. Um, you know, USDA gives us a calendar of when this, when this data is going to be available. You can see it up to 12 months forward. So there should be no, su no surprises on when the reports are released. Obviously, the contents of the report is what everybody's looking for. So on my next slide, this is just a quick summary of what's called the pre-report industry estimates. So uh, some of the large agricultural news agencies like Reuters and Bloomberg and several others will do uh, surveys of private forecasters and say, what do you expect the USDA numbers to be? And I want to emphasize before I go on any further, this is not these individual companies' individual estimates. This is not what they're estimating the actual number is. What these companies are trying to do is estimate what is, you, what is the USDA number going to be? What do they expect the USDA information to look like? So these are actual estimates for what they think USDA is going to provide us on Tuesday. Um, and, and because this is a little bit unique where we have both the old crop, the 2019-20 marketing year, as well as the 2021 marketing year, try to divide this table up. So let's start with the old crop information first. The top row is the average industry estimate. That's the one in red. And if you look at uh, the April estimate, which is the number in blue, so let's compare the red, red row to the blue row, um, and we look at wheat, basically unchanged. They don't expect the ending stocks. Now, this is, again, the forecast for ending stocks. How much, how much grain are we going to have in the bin just before harvest of the, of the upcoming year, of the next year? So when we think about harvest of, of wheat this year, how much wheat do we think we'll have in inventory just before harvest begins in July? Again, primarily for winter wheat. And right now, the average industry estimate versus what we saw last month from USDA is really unchanged. I would consider that to be unchanged. It's a rounding error difference. When we look at corn, uh, the April estimate was about 2.1 million billion bushels, excuse me, 2.1 billion bushels. The average trade guess is about 2.25 or 22, excuse me, um, which is really an increase in ending stocks, which to me implies that I think most traders and most analysts right now are thinking that the, the total usage of corn for ethanol production will go down again. Um, that's about 130 million bushel difference. Um, which seems like a lot, but there could be also be some cut in the in the forecast for um, for exports. We'll have to wait to see. Again, this is just a private estimates of what they think the ending stocks number will be for old crop. When you look at the soybean numbers, uh, again, I would consider those to be basically unchanged. Um, average trade guess versus the numbers we saw last year. They're not. It doesn't seem that there's going to be any big expectation in in a change in that. But I would like to shift over now into the far right hand columns which look at the, the new crop numbers for 2020 as well as 2021 for that marketing year. And I wanna compare the, the, the new crop numbers with the old crop numbers. Okay, so again, these are forecasts for how much grain do we think we're having the bin just before harvest of 2021. So we're looking a year forward in time. And, and I guess this, I think, will signal some of the information that, that what, are, what are the traders expecting to see? So if we compare uh, wheat for old crop versus new crop, um, it, the expectation is that new crop ending stocks for the new crop for this coming year will, will go down slightly. And again, I think part of that is because we're going to see a slight cutback in, in, um, in, in planted acreage, and the, there's an expectation we'll have more of a trend line yield at this stage of the game. I guess the one I think is causing some concern and angst amongst people is the corn number. Um, so when you look at the forecast for ending stocks on corn in new crop versus the ending stocks of corn in old crop, there's about a 1.1 billion bushel difference, which is very substantial. 
And I'll go through the reasons for that in, in just a moment. So just hold off right now, but I just wanna show the, the I guess the difference in expectations between the, the crop we harvested last year versus the one we're planting right now. And on the soybean side, it looks again, the right now based on the numbers, we're expecting to see a slight cutback in ending stocks on soybeans. And again, there's a pretty substantial reason for that that I'll talk about on my next slide. Thank you. Um, so how does USDA come up with the production estimates? So for, for some of this, we can anticipate because there is a, a process that USDA uses as they prepare this information. So for the production side of the ledger, for new crop production, um, they use the prospective plantings report, which we got at the end of March. Um, and they will use those planted acreage numbers. They'll adjust for the difference between planted and harvested acreage. But these will be the numbers we start with. And, and those numbers will not be adjusted until we get into probably July, because there's another survey of what in June of what farmers actually planted versus what they intended to plant. So the July um, USDA WASDE report then will update the planted acreage numbers based on the new survey. So this is really what farmers were signaling earlier this spring on what they intended to plant. And as we've talked about in previous sessions, um, those planting and intentions were based off of information in the marketplace before, really before the COVID-19 issues hit the market and, and we've seen the, the rapid adjustment. So right now, um, I, I, I'm very confident that USDA will use about 97 million acres for corn, corn plantings. Um, again, that's planted acreage, not harvested. For soybeans, the 83 and a half million acres, and for all wheat, about 44.6 million acres. And then again, I, I put in last year's numbers just as reference, looking at a pretty large increase in corn, corn acreage, um, a, a cutback, I mean, another increase in soybeans, but again, recognize we had a lot of PP last year for soybeans. And on the wheat side, a, a very small cutback from last year's numbers. The other thing USDA is going to do is use a trend line yield that's been adjusted for planting progress. So they use, again, historical long-term averages. They adjust for uh, growth in, in trend line yields or growth in yield potential. Um, but there's a slight adjustment they also make for how quickly are we planting the crop. And obviously, if the crop goes in much earlier, we tend to have higher yield expectations, or at least the potential for above average year, versus if we have very slow plantings like we did last year, um, that yield forecast typically comes down. So I did want to provide a quick refresher on what the pro crop progress report as that was released last Monday. It's as of Sunday. We'll get a new, new crop report again out on Monday of this year, um, excuse me, next week. For corn plantings, we're about 51% nationwide, about 51% complete in plantings versus 39% as a five-year average. On the soybean side, we're about 23% planted versus an 11% as a five-year average. And on spring wheat, again, this is nationally about 6% planted versus 16% as a five-year average. Now, those fairly aggressive corn and soybean plantings numbers, you know, a lot of that is really contained in two states, which are the big corn states and soybean states of um, Iowa and Illinois. So if you were to break, look at a state-by-state -state breakdown, the Iowa-Illinois planting progress has been exceptionally quick. And again, that's where we have a lot of our acreage and a lot of our yield potential. So I would not, ex I would not be surprised to see a, a trend line, an estimated trend line yield to be slightly above what we would have seen if we had had normal planting progress. So on our next slide, I talk a little bit about, you know, how do we, how does USDA forecast the usage numbers or kind of the demand side of the equation? And this is really where I'm going to be spending most of my time studying the numbers when they come out. Um, so I want to explain a little bit about the process before we get into the analysis portion of it. But what USDA does is they, it's based on uh, the demand side is really based on statistical forecasting. So they're using historical relationships, historical information and saying, look, what are the trends? What are some of the relationships we see? And then they try and put forecast forward for the, for the, um, the, um, to forecast the uh, total usage by category for the entire year. Okay, and they do that for both the national level within the United States as well as the global level or the world level. And the reason they have to do the global stuff is primarily because of the, uh, of the export pace or uh, preparing a, an, uh, a forecast for US exports, which again, you have to take in the global dynamics as part of that. I just wanna emphasize this is really a very complex process and it's very, very difficult to do well. 
Um, there are a few private forecasters that will do their own forecasting. Uh, but a lot of the private forecasting firms, um, when they come out with an estimate, their own estimate, it'll be actually some more subjective forecasting. They'll, they'll use what was embedded in last year's numbers, and they'll grind, increase it or decreases on a more of a subjective basis on what they think the new numbers would look like. So I just want to emphasize that this is a really, really difficult thing to do. And there's a, a lot of firms that look to the USDA numbers as kind of that starting point. And also on a side note, I want to emphasize that uh, export levels are by far the most difficult to forecast accurately, just because of all the moving parts and the dynamics. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to uh, come back to some stuff that we've had talked about previously that in today's world and the global economy with the concerns about COVID-19 and, and concerns about a global recession, um, this is becoming more and more challenging as we move forward in time. So on my next slide, um, I also want to talk a little bit about the 2019-20, the old crop. Uh, at this stage of the game, again, there will likely not be any major adjustments on the production side. This will be some adjustments on the usage side. Again, USDA is using these statistical forecasting techniques, but they're updating the information every month based on new values. And these are the actual values. So for example, when it, when it comes to forecasting total exports, um, they use the, the historical or the actual export pace based on weekly export sales numbers and say, well, based on the trends we see right now, what do we expect the total to be by the end of the year? On ethanol, again, when they're using uh, forecasting total ethanol use of corn, those forecasts are revised based on the weekly ethanol production numbers. So you get an idea of, are we ahead of normal or behind normal? And then finally, another example of soybean crushing. Again, this is um, using the information that they have a survey of oilseed crushers to say how quickly are they crushing up the soybean inventory. So again, they're using real, real live data to try and update and make their forecast going forward as accurate as possible. So on the next slide, I've tried to provide um, a, a brief summary of what am I looking for? What are the things that I expect to see? Um, a couple things, I think there's gonna be a lot of focus on the corn usage numbers. Um, not only in the production outside, but then on the corn usage numbers as well. We have three major categories for corn usage under the ethanol, I mean, under the USDA definitions. First one is ethanol. Again, the recovery in miles driven, I think, is the greatest uncertainty right now. You know, how quickly will people recover and start using up more gasoline? Um, my expectation is that I think the ethanol number will be down slightly from what we would typically see. I'm not using today's conditions as that reference point, but if we were to go back a couple of years before all this came, came into play, I think there'll be a slight cutback because I, I don't expect USDA to have the full um, ethanol, uh, the ethanol mandate included. I think it's going to be very difficult to get to the levels that we're talking about, even, even as we recover into the new crop year. On the feed side, a lot of that's going to, uh, the feed demand is going to be uh, influenced by livestock inventories and, and the herd size. Uh, given the, the drop in meat prices, I know Tim is going to talk about that in a moment. Um, I don't expect the feed, the total herd size to change a lot, but we may see a slowing of the growth rate in meat production. Again, this, this is all forecasting at this point, and so it, it can be updated as we move forward. So I'm not expecting to see a big change in the feed number. The exports number, I think, is going to be the biggest challenge just because corn, again, that hits the export market typically goes for livestock feed. And there's a lot of uncertainty now in the global market on what does that meat demand really look like. Again, given the, that we've seen a, a strong economic downturn at the global level as well as within the United States. On the soybean side, I'm really focusing on those export numbers. Um, there's a lot of questions right now about this US-China phase one agreement and its implementation process and will China be able to live up to their expectations, again, as well as the concerns about the global production of meat. My guess right now, my expectation right now is, is USDA as, as a rule generally forecasts exports given current policy. So again, given what we know about current policy, they're assuming that policy will stay in place throughout the forecasting period. Um, I do expect them to include the impacts of a fully implemented phase one agreement. So again, those soybean export numbers may seem a little bit strong um, given today's information, but again, we'll have to wait and see. On the wheat side, again, exports and the wheat market is really the, the key pricing piece. Um, 
big question is, will US be price competitive? And again, a lot of that depends upon the, the slowdown or potential slowdown in global growth um, and this global demand base. And so again, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns. My last slide, um, I wanted to provide also just a little bit of insight into the uh, something that the trade uh, analysts and, and traders will be also be looking at is, what do we expect to see out of production from South America? Um, I, again, I just wanted to have a reference point for this is what the industry uh, traders and analysts are kind of looking at as an average versus what USDA has said last month. So the red line on the very top is the average industry estimate. The blue line is what USDA had forecast last uh, month. So again, we're, uh, when we look at uh, Argentina corn, um, basically I would consider that unchanged to down maybe slightly as an average. On the soybean side, very similar. Um, either very, I would, my personal view is that's basically unchanged, maybe a slight decrease. Brazilian corn is the one that's getting a little bit more attention right now. Um, when you look at USDA estimate last month was 1 .1, uh, 101 million metric tons. Uh, the average trade guess is closer to 99. I know there's some concerns now about the safrina crop, which is their second crop that makes up about, or what they call the winter crop, which they're seeding right now, um, because there are some dry areas in Brazil starting to show up. And, and the safrina crop, just as reference, is approximately 75% of Brazil, Brazil's total corn production. And so that does have a major role to play in kind of what their total production out of Brazil is going to be. On the soybean side, I think there's some traders that are thinking we would see a slight decrease in the average uh, or in the, in the total production forecast for, for Brazilian soybeans. But I do want to remind everybody that even if it gets cut slightly, if it goes down to 124 or 123 and a half, um, those are still very, very large numbers. If you look at the row just below the blue line, um, that's the USDA number for total uh, metric tons produced from last year. So this would be basically uh, uh, two seasons ago. So you, you can use what we're expecting now versus last year's numbers. And as you can see on the Brazilian soybean column, the far right hand side, um, even with a slight cutback, the, the Brazilian soybean crop is going to be a monster. It's going to be very, very large, even in, in, a, in, um, his, in, even in historical context. The last thing I just want to point out for reference, just so everybody can get a, a, a benchmark for relative size. I also put in last year's um, USDA numbers for U.S. production. Again, this is converted to million metric ton instead of billion bushels, which you're used to thinking in. So I just wanted to give you a relative size of the U.S. corn crop last year, the U.S. soybean crop last year, relative to what we see in both Brazil and Argentina. And again, if you look on the far right hand side, the size of the U.S. crop last year, even though it was cut because of, of, of um, a lot of prevent plant, was is still considerably smaller than what we see coming out of Brazil. So Brazil's grown into a major, major powerhouse on the soybean side. And with that, I'll hand things over to Tim. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if we go to my next slide, we'll see that most of the calls I've been getting are really twofold this week. One is, you know, are we gonna get a payment? What's going on there? And so I uh, kind of talk about that and do some other issues as we go along and a lot of issues in, in the livestock industry now. And so uh, we are going to uh, touch on those with, with another webinar. So to begin with, the uh, coronavirus food assistance program, you know, is supposed to put $5.1 million into cattle producers and and so on, and some more for hogs and dairy and so on. And, uh, you know, expectation, the president wanted to get this through as soon as possible. But as we've been saying all along, it's a monumental task that USDA has to try to figure out how to distribute all this money. And we've talked about that in previous uh, webinars, you know, 85% compensation for cattle sold from January 1st to April 15th and so on. Are cows going to get paid and all those things we don't know about. But here's the progress. Uh, USDA on Tuesday of this week, as you see in the red at the top, did send the final uh, proposed rule to the OMB. 
and the Office of Management and Budget, they have two weeks to try to figure out where all the money's coming from and how to do it and so on and get a rule uh, set up. Uh, the, they have been working with USDA, so the anticipation is that they won't take the full two weeks. In fact, uh, some saying that it could come out next week. On the bottom, one of the consternations in the livestock industry is kind of uh, not, uh, uh, you know, on the same level on this, there's a question. Uh, the law, when it come out, didn't put any limits on individual producers, but the farm bill has uh, uh, limits on individual producers. And so the question has been, will USDA raise those cap limits or not? And so the next one just yesterday, uh, Secretary Purdue was in a meeting and he said that uh, payment limits would be increased, but uh, if you go on through down there, I'm just skipping ahead. He said, we've adjusted these payment limits, but we'll have to wait and see when the rules come out or when they are. So that's about all we know for that. On the next one, again, Senator Hoven uh, is uh, saying that there's interest in adding even more money to the Commodity Credit Corporation for them to use, uh, you know, on the, on the crops and livestock side. On the packing side, again, I could talk for an hour on this and plants and so on, but I just want to kind of summarize. Uh, all beef packing plants that were closed uh, have reopened, but we had one closure this past week, Cargill at Schuyler, Nebraska. The plants that opened, uh, Tyson opened their plant in Washington State and Dakota City, and JBS opened their Green Bay, Wisconsin, and Greeley plants, and then a a smaller plant in Aurora, Illinois opened up and then the national plant in Tam, Iowa, again, a regional plant. So we're, you know, back open. The bad news is that, uh, you know, they're not at the capacity they were before they closed with all the distancing and so on, but got some plants back going. And if we go to the next slide, I'll just finish up by the, you know, the hog plant and we're our two closest plants in uh, JBS and Worthington and the Smithfield in, uh, in uh, Sioux Falls are back uh, open, but at a much reduced capacity. So uh, Frayne talked about exports a little on the grain side. And so the new report for meats just came out uh, again just to review a little bit that we do have record production of beef, pork, and chicken, and so uh, exports are important, and we were expecting record exports of U.S. For, for sure beef and pork, maybe not chicken, but but more above last year. And so uh, again, the problem with this is it's a little bit dated. It just came out this week, but it's the March numbers. And so far in March on the top left, you see that uh, beef and exports were quite a bit above last year and on a record pace. Uh, and uh, however, I know both on beef and pork, some anecdotal evidence in the last couple of weeks. One, of course, our wholesale prices have increased. And then, you know, some other uh, 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 problems uh, with those higher prices, it, it limits other countries' ability to to uh, buy. So we'll have to see the April will likely uh, come down, whether they'll come down to last year or whatever. Uh, is it will have to remain to be seen. On the pork export side, again, we're just going uh, gangbusters there started in, in last fall and November and greatly ramped up uh, pork exports at just all time record high, you know, not quite double what they were last year, but really, really high more on that in a minute of where it's going. On the bottom left then is where is our beef going? Japan is usually our best market and then, uh, you know, Korea, Mexico and Canada. And so you see in that square box, blue box there, uh, last year our exports to our number one uh, exporting country of, uh, of Japan uh, kind of fell off while Korea picked up. And so there were quite a few months where they were at the same level. Very good reason for that because we settled our trade agreement with Korea early in 2019, but we didn't settle with Japan until the end of the year. In fact, uh, our, our new trade agreement with Japan became effective uh, on January 1st of this year. And so, you know, since the new agreement with Japan, you see what happens. They're back up quite a bit higher than than they were and 
and uh, you know a really good market for us and and back up above Korea on the right hand side then is pork exports uh, obviously um, you know there again it's it's Japan and Korea and and Mexico and and so on, but uh, which are we're all holding fairly steady. But the big increase, China was number four, and they have just skyrocketed into the number one place in taking pork from us because of their significant downfall, twenty five uh, to forty percent reduction in their pork and so they're needing a, a lot of pork there is you know s some complaints by consumers of why when i go to the grocery store can i only buy one package of pork or whatever and whatever and when we're doing all kinds of gangbuster uh exports but again it's similar to to you know there are plants geared up for exports just like there are plants geared up to provide meat to restaurants and there are plants geared up to provide it to retail stores and it's hard to make the switch. You know, we have a hog plant on the East Coast that just does uh, uh, pork into carcasses and ships it to China that way. They don't break it down because China wants carcasses so they can cut it the way they want to and, and they've got cheap labor. And so, you know, th those carcasses that could not find easily a home in the U.S. side because uh, uh, wholesalers, retailers here want to buy boxes of hams or loins or, or ribs or uh, bellies, whatever it might be. So go to the next slide. Uh, just want to give you an update again like I usually do on the markets. Uh, USDA again reports auction markets at uh, when they're when we're going full blast particular in the earlier in the spring and in the fall at West Fargo Napoleon Mandan and Dickinson and this time of the year they they stop reporting when the market uh, receipts fall way down and and uh, so at last week actually only Mandan got reported and but you know that's the the base that we have to go by and you know uh, prices for the lightweight cattle in the box there still selling about what they were last year at uh, you know fairly decent levels given all the pandemonium that we have going on there you know uh, 570 pound steer that bring 160 is 925 dollars so you know that's for most producers above the cost of production at about a, a normal level and again we've always been talking about these 750 to 8 weight down with the next box or on the average you know about the same as last year up about a dollar so uh, but but you know now with planting going on and even harvest uh, of corn the uh, you know our receipts are dropping off like like they do usually seasonally when when we uh, get rid of the last background cattle. So go to the next slide is the uh, just the slide that I've been showing before and again how the cash market is doing for the seven to eight hundred pound steers that we have the um, most of rather than the lightweights. The big news there is from last week uh, again the cash market is that red line is just about the same, but the big news is that the futures market uh, last week was quite strong, went up $10, our May futures last week, and I talked to you were 120, and uh, yesterday were 130, and uh, then the fall futures that were 130 last week are up to 140, so fully a $10 increase. We had two uh, strong, we had a limit movement on Wednesday, so we had expanded limits yesterday, and so quite a move up there. Interestingly enough, November feeder cattle now are the same price that cash feeder cattle were in North Dakota last week. So, you know, qu quite an interest there. And if we go to my next slide, then that has sparked some interest in uh, livestock risk protection. I had several calls. Uh, why is an LRP being offered and some other issues? So just cover that. When the feeder cattle and or fed cattle move the limit, then uh, LRP is not offered. And so again, we had both in fed cattle and feeder cattle limit up or expanded limit up movements on Tuesday and Thursday. So there, it wasn't offered. Today, the market has been down. Last I looked down 50 cents to a dollar. And so that would mean maybe that, uh, they, that LRP for cattle 
uh, would be offered. LAM LRP has not been offered since March 30th, over a month there because of the insufficient price reporting. There isn't a futures market for LAM, so depend on the cash market there to do that. And and, there, and the very limited LAM trading has, has caused that to be down. So I think oh, with that, that is probably the end of what I had to say. And oh, oh, one more, yeah, one more important thing. All, all this, uh, a lot of talking in the beef industry about different things like imports and exports and packer profits and how, how can we get more, more local meats out and, and mandatory cool and all that. So we've set up a whole series of webinars to address those issues in detail along with Texas A&M and West Virginia. So here's the schedule. We did the first one last night where we just did an overview of cool and imports, exports, packer profits. Then we're going to hit them in depth. So feel free to log on to those webinars uh, next week in depth on cool and imports, exports, and uh, and then on Thursday on Packer Profits. And you can read the rest on down. So in depth on what all these issues that are being discussed in the beef industry now and, and what's the scientific evidence there. So I think then with that, uh, I'm through and we'll turn it over to Ron to give his update. Good afternoon. Um, uh, Ron Haugen, Extension Farm Management with NDSU. And I wanted to talk a little bit today about the IRS updates and the PPP updates, the Payroll Protection Program. So my first slide, um, getting to the PPP updates, uh, the Treasury Department has, has, has said that businesses will have till May 14th to pay back any PPP loans if they had other adequate sources of liquidity. So they're trying to crack down on some of this, some abuse that had happened. They did have the date set at May 7th, but they extended it to May, to May 14th. So uh, there's some businesses that probably could have gotten by without getting these loans. They had other sources and they're starting to crack down on that. So uh, the last uh, allocation that was put in for the PPP loans was that uh, 210 billion. And of that, 175 billion has been used for approximately 2.2 million loans. And if they get some payback from some of these larger, larger um, businesses, um, that that amount, the pool will increase uh, uh, to make allocations uh, to other other businesses. So my next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, the taxation of PPP. And as always, these regulations and, and laws and are changing by the minute. And, and it's just as I was preparing this presentation, I just found out that Congress is working on some other legislation here, and I'll get to that. But the IRS, just on May 5th, uh, 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 said, uh, passed a notice or uh, prepared a notice number 2020-32. And what the IRS says that if you have gotten a PPP loan and the unforgiven part, the loan part then, you can still deduct the expenses that you paid from those proceeds. Just like any other loan you may have gotten, the loan may be borrowed, you may borrow money uh, as, as a loan and pay your expenses. But anything that was forgiven, you need to go through the hoops of course to get the loan forgiven or parts of the loan forgiven there is no deductibility of these expenses allowed from those proceeds. And that's the IRS double dip rule uh, because the CARES Act had already said that uh, money, um, that money uh, from the PPP would not be, uh, for the forgiveness would not be taxable. Typically, any loans that are forgiven, uh, you, uh, that amount needs to be taxed, uh, would be treated as taxable income with some, with some exceptions for insolvent, insolvent and things like that. But so just, just this morning then Congress has by, had, had put together some bipartisan legislation. Senator Grassley was just adamant saying we, we want to fix this program problem. We, we want to override what the IRS has just said so that you can deduct your expenses even if some of your loan was forgiven. And uh, so it's just a matter of time. They said they were going to uh, put that fix into the next COVID bill or maybe some other legislation and get it, uh, get it through uh, very quick. So that's the update on that. 
the next slide, I just wanted to get into a little bit about the payroll deferral. Um, all businesses, as I mentioned here in a, a few weeks ago, they all businesses are eligible for this payroll deferral, uh, whether your business has been drastically affected by the COVID or not. Uh, but any payroll deferrals are, uh, you can defer from, from payroll paid from March 27th to the end of this year. And what you can defer is the employer part of the social security tax, that 6.2%. You are not, you cannot defer the 1.45% Medicare tax. For self-employed, there was a little more guidance on this now, 50% uh, of the 50% uh, uh, can be deferred. Now of your total deferments for the year 2020 then, 50% of those deferments, uh, you, you don't need to pay until December 31st of 2021. And the other 50%, uh, you don't have to pay till December 31st, 2022. But the thing is, if you, if you defer them that long and some businesses which are in dire straits right now may not even be in business or maybe in more dire straits, they might not have the ability to even pay those deferments and then you'll probably be, be in bigger trouble. But my main point I wanted uh, to get to on this slide though, was on PPP loans that were forgiven, uh, that were used for payroll then, you are not eligible for that payroll tax deferment uh, uh, after the date of forgiveness. So if you go through all the hoops and get your loan forgiven or partially forgiven, right at that point, you're not allowed to take part of this deferral program. Um, and so any, any payroll paid after that forgiveness date um, cannot be deferred. But if you deferred payroll before that date, that will be continued, uh, that would, uh, will continue to be deferred. So with that, that's all I had for you today. Just a few updates on the PPP and, uh, and the IRS. And with that, we'll go on to Dave. Hey, thanks, Ron. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioenergy Economic Specialist. Uh, just some really quick remarks about what's going on in, in the, the biofuel sector, again, focusing primarily on corn ethanol. Uh, what we're seeing is a, a slight recovery, an increase off the bottoms for gas and ethanol use. Uh, gasoline uh, supplied as of a week ago was up 30% from its low at the beginning of April, which is very good news. Uh, unfortunately, it's a bit of a mixed bag for those of us here in North Dakota with an announcement from Great River Energy yesterday about their plans to shut down Coal Creek Station. Uh, which has a co-located uh, corn ethanol plant, Blue Flint, uh, with it. A little bit of uncertainty of what will happen with Blue Flint and, and, the, and that refinery in terms of obviously corn purchases, which would be our interest. Uh, at the same time with that announcement, uh, Spiritwood Station, which is the plant just east of, of Jamestown, they announced that they would be converting from lignite over to natural gas. Uh, you know, with, with those plans in place, you expect that uh, Dakota Spirit uh, corn ethanol refinery would, would, would stay in operation. Um, bigger than that, or in other, in other things we're definitely watching is those crude stocks are continuing to build, not at the rate that they were. And again, looking particularly at Cushing uh, and WTI to see uh, exactly when they, they might uh, run into some problems logistically. And then, problem, and then also kind of big news, international news, uh, because of its uh, severity, is we're, we're, we're continuing on this track of seeing a number of North Dakota oil wells being shut in. Uh, the expectation is in the next few weeks, almost all of them will be. Um, you know, we're, we're at least a third of the way there in terms of numbers as well as uh, production uh, that we would have had online, you know, six weeks ago. Uh, with that just basically continuing given, given the current economics uh, of production here in the state. And obviously going along with that too, no new, no new development. Uh, the rigs numbers are continuing to fall. Uh, going back to a slide, kind of similar to what I had a few weeks ago. Uh, first, I'll talk about the chart itself and then, then the table within it. Uh, the, the, the red line is gasoline supplied, has a certain scale on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, and then ethanol production and input are the blue and the yellow on, on the left-hand side. And basically what you can see as we go back to the start of, of COVID is this precipitous drop really, really in tandem with one another in terms of, of use primarily or, or supply as we call it, uh, as, as well as production. Um, not, not unexpected again as, as ethanol essentially uh, finds its home domestically as E10, so as gasoline 
pushed out to uh, ethanol refiners decline, or excuse me, it was pushed out to, to racks and, and to retailers as that declined. Obviously, the, the use of ethanol fell with it, uh, production alongside. Uh, I've already mentioned there's been a really strong recovery in, in gasoline off of its bottom in the last two weeks. Uh, the big question now is, will that continue? Just looking at the calendar, we'd expect that it would as we move into summer driving season. Of course, the question is how much are folks going to drive uh, relative to previous years? You know, we still have shelter in place in much of the country, uh, a slow recovery, uh, affected incomes. So a lot of the leisure travel is going to be offline. But we would expect that number to continue to grow uh, on the gas side and, and ethanol in tandem with it. Going back and kind of looking at what this means uh, for profitability for ethanol refineries, again, looking at those South Dakota ethanol prices, which USDA uh, reports on a daily basis. If we look from about a month ago where we were at to today, we see lower corn prices, higher ethanol prices, and, and lower distillers range prices with a, with a net, uh, net increase in crush of about 20 cents, which is definitely sizable for a refinery. Uh, so things are moving in the right direction. And so we kind of have simultaneously good news as, as plants are coming back online or just increasing uh, their crush as well as their profitability. And again, there's this expectation that if that continues for the next few weeks, that we'll continue to see uh, more ethanol production uh, as well. Don't have the, the, uh, the days in, 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 in stocks uh, this week for ethanol, but you know, they're, they're continuing to decline as we see that, that use increase. Um, my only other slide for today is just talking about oil stocks and again just kind of looking at Cushing and where we're going. Uh, we're basically at, at we're 83 percent full uh, down in, in, in Cushing. Uh, come a long ways, you know, gone from about 36 now to, to 63 million barrels in storage, which is a massive amount of, of fuel. Uh, has slowed down a little bit. Uh, which is good, or at least the pace of in, uh, increase in stocks, especially in Cushing, is decreasing, and, and also the same across the country. So that's good. And also, if we actually look at the use as use is picked up, that the actual days in stock, so that would be stocks over use, has declined uh, for the first time since the start of the crisis. And so, again, a bit of optimism there, but there's still going to be this pushback. We still have too much production of crude oil. Uh, we're still refining. The refiners are definitely, you know, throttling back their, their purchases. And then we really have to wait to see just how much gasoline is used uh, this spring. And again, this, this goes back to, to Frayne's thoughts, too. I mean, this is really kind of the big question, but, but, but in general, things are moving in the right direction. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll move on to questions. And I, and I saw that we had a few of them already. Uh, and again, if you want to use up, oh, it says chat, but please use the Q&A function uh, this week. And, and we'll try and get through those. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start moderating those, uh, but, but feel free to continue to ask questions as they come to mind. Uh, and so first thing to talk about would be, uh, and this is actually a clarification issue for, for Brian, I believe, you know, going back in for the Purdue egg sentiment survey, you know, was there something that happened in April of 18 that caused sentiment to drop? Kind of a a pretty pretty in-depth question if you have an answer for that one uh yeah thank thanks dave i i responded via the uh, chat but i'll just go ahead and say that when we were heading into the summer of 2018 what what was going, ramping up and that was the trade dispute um we know that uh you know there was discussions of it there was talk about it uh and and a lot of that stuff really came to started to come to a head there in june but sentiment on you know trade trade tensions really started ramping up that early part of 2018, and I believe that was reflected there in the in the sentiment for ag um, headed up to that point was was what was going on in um, uh, politics and the geopolitical sort of trade situation that was that that. You know, in hindsight, folks were right to be worried about it, but that 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 period, that April, May, June period, was was some of what was leading up to that. Um, and the other thing that was happening in uh, in 2018 was rising interest rates. That was that was something that was going on. We had rate increases in in 2018, um, several of them. So, uh, and toward the end of that year, we also. Uh, uh, we're worried about them headed into 19 as well. So I think that that had a lot to do with some of the 
the poor sentiment. And then of course we, the uh, commodity prices weren't all that strong. So there were several things going into it all at once. And if Frain wants to add anything to that or Tim, that, that, uh, that'd be fine too. But that's probably the biggest driver between that low sentiment in, in 18. Thanks, Brian. Uh, another question, obviously for Frain, uh, pulse crops, you know, are they included in the WASD? Uh, they're not really traded. Uh, I, I, well, I, there's not a futures market for pulses. Um, so w what's the difference? Yeah, so yeah, we do not, we don't have, USDA doesn't do any forecasting or anything formal for uh, the pulse crops um, on the supply demand side. Uh, the WASI report was created many, many, many years ago. Uh, and it follows kind of what we would consider the traditional feed grain and, and, and oil seed and food crops. So it would be the feed grains, uh, corn, um, as, as well as barley, oats, sorghum. Uh, obviously they have the wheats and, and actually have some information broken down by wheat class. They also have the oil seeds, primarily soybean. Um, they also have cotton um, and they do a little bit on rice. Uh, so the WASD report really covers kind of those long, long history crops we have in the United States. Nothing for the pulses. Uh, the fact that there is or is not a futures market uh, really doesn't dictate which crops are included. It's based more, much more on history. For example, um, there's no uh, futures market for barley here in the U.S. There is one in Canada, but not here in the U.S. But yet we still have information on, on barley. There's no futures market for sorghum, grain sorghum, but yet we do have supply demand conditions on, on, that USDA puts together for grain sorghum. So um, short answer, there really isn't a, a strong correlation between USDA numbers and, and whether there is or is not a futures market. Uh, but there's definitely not information on the pulse crops. It, it's very difficult to get supply demand numbers uh, for pulses. It's, it's just a really, really tough thing to do. Great. Thanks, Frank. I, I will make a, a, a plug for an upcoming uh, chamber event here in, in the Metro. It's a virtual event uh, sponsored by the, the Fargo Moorhead West Fargo Chamber. Uh, on the morning of the 12th uh, next week, they're having a an egg focused event uh, and you can go to the the chamber's website to learn more about that so it's fmwfchamber.com uh, just to make a plug to you NDSU is a, a proud member of the chamber as well um, if there's no other questions I want to thank you for participating and let you know that uh, we do have that we w did record this and we'll make both the recording and the, the presentations available online at the URLs on the screen and if you do have any other questions, do feel free or ha have any feedback for us, excuse me, uh, please go to the URL on the site and, and, and give us some feedback. It is much appreciated and helps guide our programming with NDSU Extension. Um, so with that, I want to- yeah, there, is, there, is there is another question for you about Great River, Dave. Okay, where is- I'm Do you seeing. have any details on if Great River will sell the power plant so it keeps running is the question. Yeah, so is, is somebody gonna buy Coal Creek? I would be surprised. Um, the, the economics for Lignite have been very challenged for quite some time. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they've, they've continued to, you know, they've been under duress and the, the COVID is, is in, like it has been in many industries is really just an accelerant. You know, there's been a, a decline in, you know, energy use, uh, in energy prices and the trading price of power to some extent. Um, and it's really, you know, a longer term issue. And I, I would be surprised to see if anyone uh, does make an offer. And obviously that's, that's bad news for the state is there's a number of uh, uh, individuals who, who work there and who work for the associated Falkirk mine. Uh, the Spearwood station, you know, was announced yesterday and I have no reason to think that, that anything would happen with that. Um, you know, it's a newer facility. And it's actually kind of one of the shames too about both Blue Flint, especially about Blue Flint, but also, uh, Midwest egg, you know, they're very, uh, very efficient, well-designed uh, corn ethanol refineries among the most efficient, uh, well-run in the country in terms of downtime. Uh, and it would be a shame to lose those in general because of that. And then obviously, of course, in terms of corn use. Uh, but going back to the original question, uh, I would be, I would be surprised if there's a buyer, um, but obviously you can, can hold out some degree of hope. And again, they, they did mention in their press release uh, and other discussions that, that it was on the market, they, they were trying to do that. Okay, then in the chat, there's one, whoops. Uh... 
yeah, and so this is a question from Cody uh, down in Wishick. Um, let's see here. Thoughts about the uh, yeah the underlying recession, doom and gloom regarding COVID. Um, you know, what are we thinking about long term? Uh, and like Brian, I don't know if you have a response you want to summarize again what what Cody's thoughts are. Boy, that's a it's a lot there in that question. I'm I'm kind of reading it here. Um, let me see. Inverted yield curve near full employment without wage growth. Um, in curiosity, okay. The underlying recession, doom and gloomers before COVID. Um, well, I, th I think a lot of that actually stemmed from the fact that we were in the, one of the longest bull market, no, not one of, the longest bull market of all time uh, since it had been recorded in terms of number of quarters and months before recession. Now, recessions do happen, business cycles do happen, and there are indicators that... Uh, that can predict them. They don't predict them, but they're what they call leading indicators, things that occur before a recession happens and, and uh, that let people know that, hey, this is, this is, this is what's coming. And like Frain would say, uh, and him and I have talked about this, the recession and the likelihood of it coming for a long, uh, many times. You know, indicators are just that, indicators, and you have to take all of them into context and evaluate everything before you you know, make a decision. In other words, the inverted yield curve thing, I gave a lot of talks on that over the last year or so. And it was a little bit of an outlier. And one of the things that was happening with that was there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot going on globally uh, in terms of, well, uh, stagnant economies and negative interest rates. And it, a lot of foreign investment was drawn into T-bills, you know, or in T-notes. And when that happens, uh, obviously it's a supply and demand thing. If demand for T notes and T bills is really high, then the inter the yield on it goes down. Okay. If demand is high, the price goes up, the yield goes down. So you can have inverted yield curves without any underlying concerns with the U S economy because of what's going on abroad or, or for, for whatever the uh, other reason may be. Now, if U S investors were flocking into these uh, T notes and T bills and those kind of things, that'd be one thing, but that really wasn't the case. There wasn't a huge increase in that. It was, it was mainly foreign investment because you had negative rates and other things in Europe. Um, and then the near full employment, uh, you know, that in and of itself doesn't pretend anything negative other than with that we had, you know, near full employment. In fact, that's actually a good thing. And so there really weren't any underlying economic factors besides, you know, a, an inverted yield curve and fears of a, the fact that we were in a long bull run or bull market uh, to, to be concerned about a, a looming recession. And we kind of saw that happen as we turned the corner headed into 2020. Now, obviously, we are going to be in a recession now, or we are in a recession now, which will show from the first and second quarter. But I don't think anyone predicts, can predict pandemics. In other words, back in November, nobody thought there was going to be a pandemic. So, you know, it's going to, history is going to show a recession like clockwork, but the, the reason for it was not economic. Unlike the financial crisis that we had 10 years ago, that was a economic and financial fundamental problem in the system that there were warning signs going into it before the whole house of cards collapsed. This isn't like that at all. We literally shut it down, not some sector or set of sectors or portions of the economy went, went under. Um, this was to use the lack of a better word, artificially induced recession because we literally just shut the economy down. I mean, just shut it down. Never before been done to my knowledge in, in US history um, ever. So I, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, those in a lucky half court shot, basically that's what it was. Yeah, I mean, you know, an inverted yield curve, it would be like saying an inverted yield curve predicts pandemics. Um, that's just not true. It, and, and the reason that it inverted is not the reason that 
typically happens before we wind up in a recession. In other words, it wasn't because U.S. investors were leaving equities and flocking into the safety of T-notes and bonds. It was other countries were doing, were kind of going there because there was some sluggish and stagnant growth abroad. And that's, that's really what it amounted to in that case. And home prices weren't lagging and sagging and employment was strong. So, you know, yes, we're, it, it did, pre, uh, an inverted yield curve did precede a recession by about six, eight months. But I think that that's pretty much coincidence in this case. That's Question for you, Dave, do you see that about how do they get natural gas to Jamestown? Yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, the question is, uh, how are they going to get natural gas to Jamestown? Yeah, right now, the, the pipe along interstate is is not large enough to, to support a a generating unit of that size, they'll have to build something. Um, there's been a lot of discussion as, you know, in, in the past been involved in, in development work, you know, with, with uh, Spiritwood uh, Park. And so, you know, maybe a little bit of silver lining in this is as they build that pipeline uh, uh, across, across the state from, from Bismarck or so over to Jamestown Spiritwood, you know, that, that there will be opportunities for economic development uh, in that area. Uh, but again, yeah, that pipeline will have to be built, um, which is not an inexpensive proposition, but obviously there's a, a very valuable asset at Spiritwood that, that Great River Energy wants to make use of. Um, so it, that, that, would be, that would be part of the deal. And, and maybe again, silver lining, that, that's a major infrastructure project and, and would mean jobs and, and all of that economic, economic activity for the state. Um, and, and so if I do double check right, uh, I think that we're uh, through our questions and, and our chat. Um, and so once again, I want to thank the panelists for participating and Scott Swanson with Ag Communications for providing IT backup and all of you for, for joining us here today. Uh, again, if you want to check out the recording uh, or the, the PowerPoints or the, the, the presentation, we're going to have those posted shortly. And then, of course, if you do have time, please provide feedback because it is greatly appreciated. And with that, I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks.